Hello. Welcome to Journey of Faith, Episode 1, Heaven and Hell. On today's program, we talk about the issue of unbelief in the Western Church, along with historical views of hell and heaven, and how the view of hell and heaven stands in the church today. Oftentimes, when you ask someone what they believe about heaven or hell, uh, today no one really answers that question seriously. It doesn't really seem to be on their minds at all. Uh, Historically, that was not the case. Uh, For centuries after the uh, birth, death, and resurrection of Christ, the ideas of heaven and hell were on the Western mind all the time. You can see it in the literature, the art, at times even the music. When you think of Verdi's great Dies Ira, Dies Ila, the anger and wrath of God against the adversary and against the wicked. It seems to be a very prevalent idea, but not so much today. Um, If I had to name one place where the ideas seem to be prevalent, it seems to be horror films. Uh, If I'm going to describe horror films in a Petersonian way, it would be the archetypical animation of the darkest parts of our mind. the, The parts of our mind of which we are most afraid. And we put them into a film, and by putting them into a film, we try to master them. Um, Just the other day I was watching The Thing, made in 1986, I believe. I won't tell you how it ends, but needless to say, there is much disembowelment and death and destruction all throughout it, and such that it very, very much comes across hellish at times. So, we can at least say that the hellish ideas maybe have perhaps just moved. Our descriptors for them have merely changed. It's not that people are so averse to the idea of heaven and hell that they don't want to think about it at all. That doesn't seem right. On the other side, the the present situation in secular thought on heaven doesn't really seem to come up very much at all. Um, You get it in the secular idea of utopia. Everybody seems to be fighting for the world to be a better place, to create a heaven on earth, if you will. Uh, Whether or not this is ever successful is very much up for debate, but at the very least, we want to create a world that is bereft of pain and suffering. It doesn't seem that we care about a world... Um, that only has pain and suffering. We, 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 we want to come to a place where there is no pain and suffering. Uh, but turning away from the secular world, specifically to the church, um, thinking about the church's history on heaven and hell. At one point, hearing a sermon on heaven and hell from the pulpit was a regular occurrence. It went hand in hand with a traditional gospel presentation. It went hand in hand with the preacher calling the people to repentance. That does not seem to be common anymore. I can't remember the last time I was sitting in a regular mainline evangelical church hearing something about heaven and hell. Uh, As a matter of fact, the last time I heard anything from the pulpit regarding heaven and hell was at a Catholic Mass during the homily. The priest proceeded to delineate all of the various torments of hell and all of the various manifestations of the bliss of heaven. Aside from that, I don't recall any mention 
of heaven and hell. Uh, this series is called The Journey of Faith. It seems good to an- announce. The reason that is is because we're all on a journey, and I'm on a journey as well. And there are definitely things that I believe are true that I will never question. But there's a lot of things that I feel all of us could benefit from unpacking. I'm going to unpack these things for myself. I'm going to basically um, stream of consciousness style think these things through. And hopefully you will also be encouraged to think these things through on your own and continue on this path of thought to the correct destination. And God willing, I get to the correct destination as well. Before I talk about the church's views on heaven and hell anymore, it seems right to talk about the history of my own views of heaven and hell. (coughs) My initial moment of faith, where I was on the road to Damascus, if you will, was when I realized that there was such a thing as judgment. There has to be. There has to be such a thing as judgment. There has to be such a thing as right and wrong, and we want wrong actions to be judged and condemned. Then we want right actions to be rewarded. At least this is typically how we view the situation. So my initial reaction was, of course, fear of the fires and torments of hell. And I believed God was right in putting the, putting these torments upon man. Uh, and that is what I considered to be correct. And I knew that I deserved that. And I came to a point where I wanted to flee from what I knew to be my destruction and demise and flee to Christ. And that is where I've been ever since. That That has not changed But different minutia of my thinking on the topic has changed as I've gotten older. I've questioned more. Uh, I recall some of my different questions about hell. Is that why would God put someone there? Why would God condemn anybody to hell? Why is that even right? Torture for all of eternity for a finite period of sin and the answer that at least has satisfied me that honestly is yet again another answer of faith is that ultimately God is so majestic so beautiful so powerful so other his his thoughts are not our thoughts that there is literally no reason for me to ask that question. He is who he is. And I am who I am. And who he is is better than me because he's God. There's no logical way that if God exists, if he exists, then he is an infinite being. If he exists. And if he's an infinite being, by nature of that fact, he's, he's undefeatable. Whatever he decides as the correct path is the correct path. But more than that, the way I answered this question in my own mind was looking at creation. I looked up, I saw the stars in their millions of myriads, looked up and discovered that there was such a thing as a visible universe with hundreds upon thousands of galaxies, billions upon billions of light years away from one another. Saw how massive and immense that was, and I got an idea in my mind, of the holiness and so otherness of God. There's there's no other answer that has satisfied me. Uh, I think a lot of people don't see that, and we can get to that later. Um, But the other question about hell uh, is quite simply... Is hell even a place? And if it is, is it eternal? Uh, We can first take the subconscious and unconscious testimony of the human mind 
We all seem to have a very vivid conception of the idea that hell is possible, if not in the next life, by the actions of many humans, we can definitely create hell on this earth. That's, that's the bare minimum. At the very least, we know hell as a concept is possible. The gassing of six million Jews seems to prove this. Hell is most definitely possible. But as far as the existence of an eternal place, you have to be a bit more of a skittish person, I guess, to get to the point where you wholeheartedly believe that. Uh, I choose to believe that it is a place, but then that really makes us ask, what is belief? Anybody can mentally assent to the idea that hell is a possibility on earth. Anybody can assent to the possibility that hell might even be something that exists beyond this life. But deeper than that, when somebody believes something, how does it affect them? Because if you really believe something is real and present and in action, as you sit here listening to this or turning it off, then it's going to affect you in some way. If I believe that somebody is going to point a gun to my head, shoot me between the eyes, I am going to respond to that with certain ferocity. That ferocity comes from the belief that I am about to die. That ferocity comes from the belief that it is about to be over, for all intents and purposes, for Vox Veritas, if he does not either get this gun away from this person shooting me, or flee the scene. Belief is a visceral thing, otherwise known as faith. Faith is a visceral, effective thing, working in a person to create fruit. The fruit of the knowledge and belief that I'm about to die by a gunshot wound to the head causes me to either disarm my opponent or flee the scene. And that brings us to our discussion of the modern church, specifically the church in the West. We've already established that there does not seem to be any sort of discussion whatsoever of heaven or hell. I consider this to be a very damning thing. I don't know if it's appropriate to discuss what the reasons are for why heaven and hell might, be, might not be discussed in the church. Uh, I mean, perhaps it's that hell doesn't really fill up pews, and in the West we're experiencing so much of what we would like to believe is heaven right here and now that there doesn't seem to be a need to speak of it from the pulpit in ways that engender longing in a soul. Uh, so with that in mind, the current view of heaven and hell, I'm about to extrapolate it from some of my own views and then applying the way I think about things and the darkness in my own soul to what I believe must also be the darkness around me. And that could, could easily be a false way of looking at things. Um, and for that, I beg your forgiveness. But nevertheless, let's unpack it. Maybe we'll get something from this. Whenever we talk about hell with Christians, there seem to be a, a number of responses. Some Christians... Uh, really downplay hell. Either they say that it's not eternal, they don't include it in their gospel message, if they have a gospel message. Uh, and the idea of God's holiness and justice is never discussed in a gospel presentation. Which, which seems strange, because um, for centuries that was not the case. 
the basis of any need for salvation was on the fact that humanity was sinful, God was perfect and set apart, high and lifted up in the heavens, wreathed in resplendent light and majesty, and so above and beyond human comparison and description, and so beautiful and so good and so amazing and so perfect that the penalty for not living in line with that perfection was hell. Not only that, it's the most pure beam of love in, in existence. Like, there is no other love as amazing as somebody who would bleed and die for people who cursed him to his face. And you know of whom I speak. That love is seen nowhere else. So, God is so set apart, so other, it doesn't make any sense that the situation of humanity should not be discussed. So then you apply this to the way we evangelize, the way we discuss our souls with other humans. If we believe hell exists, now I'm talking to the real fundamentalist types. You know, there's some people who don't think hell needs to even be talked about at all. That, that doesn't seem to be in keeping with anything in scripture, anything in church history. That seems to be heavily influenced by Western culture, that particular secular view. But, but now let's draw our minds to the folks who claim that they believe hell exists, that it is literal fire and torment as a result of man's sin. Sin. They say, okay, they believe. Well, let's think about our previous definition of belief. Belief is like a gun pointed to your head. You believe something. You believe that the gun is pointed at the head of the universe. The gun is pointed at the head of people who have not come to the knowledge of Christ, and yet does that knowledge, if it is even a knowledge we possess, affect anyone at all? We spend more time thinking about our own life path, our own plans and machinations that we have set out for ourselves, our own family struggles, the next meal, and how many times do we sit on the freeway and think, these people are under the condemnation of God for their sin. So if we really believe that, it's like a gun being pointed at our head, and we do everything we can to either disarm the opponent or flee the scene. Or in the case of somebody else having a gun pointed at their head, saying, flee the scene, flee to safety, get safe. But that doesn't seem to be the bent of any preaching in the Western church. It doesn't seem to be the bent of any thinking in the Western church. And, you know, I guess I'm not going to comment on whether that's right or wrong, but I can definitely say it's not in keeping with any of church history or anything that is shown in Scripture. So either we need to come up with an entirely new basis for Christendom, or we need to return to our roots. There is no other choice. Either Christendom must change its roots entirely and come up with new standards entirely, or Christendom must go back to its roots. So, we've discussed a lot of hell. Um, now we talk about heaven. Uh, people love talking about heaven. You know, there's, there's tons of views about it. I'm going to go talk to my grandma who died. You know, that's tragic that somebody's grandma died, but going and talking to your grandma doesn't seem to be the main point of heaven in Scripture. The main point of heaven seems to be that you are uninhibitedly in the presence of Almighty God. That doesn't seem to be a very romantic idea for many people. I know it hasn't been for me. I oftentimes don't even think of heaven. I'm still trying to get my mind around the fact that the judgment of God is a thing. 
heaven doesn't really seem to be something we consider. But when it is, we have to think, what is the right and proper consideration of heaven? Logically, we can conclude that if heaven is an amazing place and it's great and that it's better than this world because God is there, then we have to think about what should be the right conclusion we draw from that. Well, shouldn't we long to be there consistently? I mean, there are scriptures about this. It says in one book that the Lord is coming to save those who are eagerly awaiting his return. Emphasis on the word eagerly. It talks about how she would, we should redeem the time, watch and pray. There's a parable in the Gospels about the uh, wedding attendants, how they have these torches lit and they fall asleep and their torches go out and they don't keep their torches lit and then they return. Uh, the, the, the Lord returns and they are sitting there asleep and they wake up and realize that he's come and gone and he's inside the uh, feast and the doors are shut fast and they knock on the door and they are left in the outer darkness with weeping and gnashing of teeth. Nothing about the return of the Lord excited them. They were more content to sit out on the street and sleep. I cannot even begin to deride the systems of thought that have crept up in Christendom. There's a system that seeks to pull you down from birth to death. From day one, you are going to school, usually. In school, you are being told that you need to go to college. In college, you are typically being told that you must get married and bear children and encourage them to follow the same system. That you must save money from the time you were 18 for retirement. That way you can enjoy your winter years. The whole thing here is how can you get the most pleasure out of life. Emphasis on the word pleasure. Pleasure being the thing we worship and the Bible being the thing that condemns that intensely. In the last days there will come men who have a form of godliness but deny its power. And there will be a great falling away before the return of the Lord. I'm not saying that these things are in fact proof that the great falling away is in the process of happening, I am saying that it is something worth considering. If we love God, we love the place where he most unreservedly shows his majesty, that place being heaven. And if we love God, we love heaven because that is where he most shows himself. But how many people think of that? Do I? I've spent more time thinking about my troubles and concerns. Needless to say, I find heaven and hell to be some of the most damning evidence that something is intensely wrong with the Western Church and something is intensely wrong with us. I know there's something wrong with me. I can't speak for you. But I ask you to take this journey of faith with me. Consider your soul and your heart. Consider where you are. And pray for change in everything that means.